Yesterday, post-show, we got word that the Tepper Group, owner of the Carolina Panthers, and the city of Charlotte have come together and proposed a partnership that would essentially renovate Bank of America Stadium, which has a little bit of a little bit of age on it, right? Building's 30 years old, needs a little bit of help, sticks. It's in a nice spot, don't get me wrong. There are there are lots of NFL stadiums that are in just hot basura spots where you got to drive to it and you're in the middle of nowhere and it's not convenient. Bank of America Stadium is fairly convenient. Stay downtown, you know where you're at in Charlotte. It's easily walkable, plenty of parking, don't have to go too far, pretty vibrant area. But it needs to help, right? It needs a little bit of facelift, trying to move it into the new era, much like they're doing at PNC Arena here in Raleigh. Bank of America Stadium needs a little bit of help because they host a ton of events, NFL primarily, MLS as well, and then there's some high school stuff and some concerts, not Taylor Swift, <laughs> but some concerts. So Should they will be in Charlotte this year, though. Well, Maybe. Ass- Maybe. You're Maybe. making a big assumption there, Graham Hill. Maybe. A big assumption. And then David Tepper can claim that he got Taylor Swift to come to Bank of America Stadium, even though the Kansas City Chiefs are the ones that will be playing in Bank of America Stadium. So this deal, they're going to you know rebuild the concourses, add a nice new park, put some video screens up, new seats, blah, 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 blah. $800 million of better restrooms, which is fantastic. I totally get it. But here's the problem with this. And boy, Paul, you could just ruin a happy day, can't you? Well, I get that. But... To let you know that the status quo of the NFL is going to stay the same for the next 20 years in North Carolina. The team's not going anywhere. There was no threat to move. They were going to they were gonna stay regardless. The building could fall apart. This is not Oakland. There's a much more friendly climate here. And for those of you who criticize Dave Tepper for his business acumen and just kind of speaking before he thinks, he still owns the team and they're still here in Charlotte. So let's move on. The problem with this whole idea of renovation is that it doesn't include one thing and this is what i mean by the status quo of the nfl the crown jewel of the nfl graham is the crown jewel event of the nfl super bowl right the nfl does not want to play in open air super bowl stadiums unless it's in warm 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 weather climates where they can control the weather those of you who might remember the champion nfc championship with the panthers and the arizona yeah they were the arizona cardinals back uh, 10 years ago or so, uh, where the Southeast went through that just ridiculous kind of ice storm, and it was really hard to get into the area, and most people that were trying to cover the game couldn't fly to Charlotte. They had to fly to Atlanta to fly around the storm and then drive up. That's the kind of stuff that the NFL doesn't want to worry about, which is why these events keep getting awarded to the New Orleans and the Houstons of the world and Dome Stadiums of the world, and even Las Vegas has a big, brand-new spanking stadium. They are not planning to put any sort of cover as part of this renovation. Just down the street in Jacksonville, they just did a deal. A little bit more money, but that's because they're going to cover it with a translucent roof, which is the same roof that they're using at Allegiant Stadium. I watched that whole damn thing go up out there. It's beautiful. It lets a lot of light in, but it protects you from the elements and keeps things a little bit cooler. So what I mean status quo is if you're hoping that you were going to have a Super Bowl with the NFL here, in North Carolina, it will not happen under this current plan. They would have to add some more money to it, and I get it. Taxpayer money, taxpayer dollars, funding stadiums is not the best plan. Totally agree with that. But if you want to play with the big boys and you want to be part of that Super Bowl culture, and let's let's call it what it is, right? Detroit built Ford Field. They got themselves an NFL draft, okay? And they've sunk some money into that team as well, and they've gotten some luck, and Dan Campbell is still biting teams at the knees. But the one thing that Charlotte and the one thing that North Carolina will not have under this plan will be a Super Bowl appearance. Bank of America Stadium opened up in 1996, making it 27 years old. So these renovations have been long overdue. Uh, According to the article, WRL News posted the enhancements will include upgrade video and audio systems, modernized infrastructure, redesigned concourse, unique social areas with skyline views and exterior spaces for community gatherings and programming so <laughs> if the team's bad i guess you can just look at the skyline uh, yeah <laughs> yeah you can just look at the bank <laughs> oh, of Amer- look you can just look at the bank of america tower even more than you already can in the stadium or you can just go and experience more social gathering pl- spots and locations in, in the concourse gathering. i what's the get in price i mean let's all be honest to go to football games in the nfl if you don't have the coin to do it and you're okay sitting upper deck it's still kind of a 
planned experience, right? It's planning your planning your day, planning your planning of several months ahead. It's like, hey, what game are we going to go to? What are we going to do? I've got two cute two kids with me who like to watch football, and I'm bringing Uncle Bob and Aunt Aunt Joy are coming, and it turns into an experience, but it's not cheap. And so if I'm going for a social experience, I'm like, there's plenty of places me have social experiences where I don't have to get in the car. And I certainly don't have to go to the stadium. I'm like, I want to watch good football, though. And that's the other bit. Like, this takes care of the stadium. It doesn't take care of the team. The team will have to do its own bit. But those are two separate entities, so to speak, when it comes to the NFL experience. Yeah, I was getting ready to say, even though this is more part of the city council and it's it's two different partnerships, as you mentioned. I just hope the renovations of the stadium match the renovations that we're going to see on the field, hopefully this season or in seasons to come. Because if not, it's kind of like, what's the point of doing this? If you're not going to get a Super Bowl out of it, maybe just more concerts, more bowl games. It'll be a great experience for, let's say, the Duke's Mayo Bowl and Duke Mayo, Duke's Mayo Classic for college fan bases that are going to travel to Charlotte. But... If not, as you mentioned, it's just going to be another reason to go to a Carolina Panthers game and look at Bank of America Tower more or more social gathering spots in the concourse. I'm like, do I need big screens? Do I need to make sure that the beer is super cool and the 500 level? I mean, that's important. Don't get me wrong. But I'm like, am I going to the game to be social? See, that's the difference, I think, for a lot. Football really kind of moves along. Outside of like championship televised games, football tends to move along pretty well. Baseball is more of a social experiment, right? When you go to a baseball game, now they've tried to speed up the pitch clock and move things and make big bases or whatever it is. But when you go to baseball, and the Durham Bulls is the only this is the closest example, when you go there, you're more about, hey, I'm going to talk to my buddies, I'm going to take some selfies, have a few pops, you know, have a good time. And if the team happens to win, fantastic. Again, you're, there's this longer investment that has to come with that. With football, I only have eight, nine chances to do it every year. I'm like, if I'm going there because of the social experiment, I need to sit in the suite and whatnot. Again, that is the upper 5 to 10% of people who go to NFL games. The rest of us minions, the rest of us Clampett class, who are sitting in that you know, five, 400, 500 section, man, we're just trying to like not get sunburned. We're sitting up there with the Charlotte skyline. Yeah, I'm like, I don't need a better view of it. I can already see it. Just put a better product on the field and we'll all be happy. I'm Graham Hill with three things you need to know right now from 99.9 The Fan. The soccer tournament, a men's and women's competition featuring 56 all-star teams competing for $1 million prizes, comes back to carry beginning tomorrow through Juneteenth. Single-session single passes with access to Wake Med Soccer Park and matches on all fields start at $38 for tomorrow. Most day and evening sessions are $48. The championship doubleheader is $53. The Durham Bulls are in action tonight against the Gwinnett Stripers. The first pitch from Durham Bulls Athletic Park is scheduled for 6.35 with pregame coverage beginning at 6.15 on 6.20 a.m. Bus Sports Radio, 99.9 HD2 and 99.3 WRL News+. Plus. The Carolina Panthers and the City of Charlotte have proposed a partnership deal that would include a $800 million renovation of Bank of America Stadium and keep the NFL team in North Carolina for 20 years. Find these stories and more on WRLSportsFan.com. Uh, 1990s show American Gladiators is coming back again. Uh, they've rebooted it. Amazon ordered new episodes. They are casting for it as well. So if you want to be the next Gemini, Nitro, Blaze, or Laser, uh, you could uh, join this new American Gladiators. American Gladiators, basically American Ninja Warrior, but with more um, contact, essentially. You had to, like, swing on ropes and try to evade people that were much stronger than you or at least much more physical than you. They would try to tackle you and slam you to the ground and whatnot or shoot you with dodgeballs. They had, uh, you know, basically it was playground games, right? They took playground games and they just made them for adults and people would be breaking collarbones and twisting ankles. Ouch. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah, it's coming back. They tried to bring it back. Uh, Hulk Hogan, if you might remember, a uh, professional wrestler, uh, brought it back in 2004, I believe, or something. Oh, no, 2008. It was Layla Ali 
on that too. Muhammad Ali's daughter with Hogan. It was like in prime time for like a year. And they keep trying to bring it back and bring it back, but apparently Amazon has uh, has gotten its uh, mitts into it. All right, today is a day of anniversaries. And any day I get to play a clip of uh, Finn Scully. I'm hoping you pulled this, Graham. Uh, maybe you didn't. I don't know. Did you pull it? No, I sent it to you, but maybe you didn't pull it. So we'll start with the Shrug game. This would be the 32nd anniversary of the Shrug game. The Shrug game, right? The meme, the eh, I don't know what I'm, don't know what's happening. Michael Jordan. This would have been the kind of the day after the Shrug game in the NBA Finals, which Jordan dropped 39 points and dished out 11 dimes in a complete massacre of the Portland Trailblazers. This is what it sounded like with, oh my goodness, we're throwing it back to the 90s again, Keith and Dan on ESPN Sports Center. Hello, welcome to the show. Along with Keith Oberman, I'm Dan Patrick. Hall of Fame coach Jack Ramsey will join us to analyze game one of the NBA Finals in a moment. Not much to analyze. The spotlight, arguably on the two best players in the game. There's no argument who is the best player oh, in the no. game, though. You know, if he'd only played for the Blackhawks as well. <laughs> Goodness. The Portland Trailblazers knew it would be difficult enough. Knew they'd have to overcome Michael Jordan's ball handling, overcome Michael Jordan's team leadership, overcome Michael Jordan's clutch shooting, overcome Michael Jordan's defying of gravity. But in no practice, in no tape session, in no way could they have known they would also have to overcome Michael Jordan's three-point shooting circus. Like another element to the game, like when Magic Johnson started hitting hook shots in the finals in 87, Michael Jordan started going from way downtown. One bang, make it two. The best traditions of Nick Witherspoon here on this one night in Chicago. Three, he kept going from farther and farther out. This is a man who'd had five three-pointers during the playoffs, 27 during the regular season. He hit six in the first half, six for nine from three-point range, and even Michael said, I don't know how I'm doing it. And if he didn't know how he was doing it, think of what Rick Adelman had to say. I really don't know how you're doing it. Jordan walks off at the end of the half with an NBA Finals record of 35 points in the half. He had 39 in the game, 11 assists. What's overlooked in that game, by the way, which is the shrug game, right? Where he looks and everybody can see it in their head. Just close your eyes, not if you're driving. Close your eyes and watch Michael look to his left and just throw his hands up, palms up, and just go, I don't know what's happening. What got overlooked in that game? Scottie Pippen fooled around, nearly had a triple-double. He had 24, 10, and 9. And that was the Bulls' dominance of the Blazers that year. Ripped the heart, ripped the heart out of my grandfather, who was a Portland Trailblazers fan. Just tore him to pieces. 60 years ago today, Sandy Koufax threw his third no-hitter. He had four in his career. One year later, he would throw a perfect game in 1965 against the Cubs and then retire at the age of 30. But any day I get to play Vin Scully, call anything and tell a story about Sandy Koufax, especially this one, is always a good day. I must be the worst baseball scout in the whole world. And I'll tell you why. It has to do with Koufax. One ball and one strike. The day that he was going to try out with the Dodgers, kind of a bleak Saturday afternoon, Game was over. I knew some kid was going to try out, and I thought, well, I've got nowhere to go. Single. I'll just uh, hang out in the ballpark and go watch this kid who was just about my age. So I went down to the clubhouse, I walked in, and I saw the fella who was going to try out, and my first thought was, no chance. Ball three. The reason I said no chance was because he had a suntan. I don't mean the so-called truck driver suntan where only your forearms are tan because you're wearing a uniform. No, no. He was completely tan. He was, I thought, well, he spent all the time on the beach not playing baseball. So I waited and he put on the tryout uniform and went down to the right field corner in Ebbets Field, the bullpen. There were only a couple of people there to watch. 3-2 pitch, fouled away. And he threw pretty hard, not any harder than uh, some of the guys I faced when I was trying to play ball in college. And he bounced some curveballs, and I thought, well, 
He's just a fellow who they're taking a look at and spends his time on the beach. And that'll be that. I'll probably never see him again. Yeah, right. Way to go, Vin. <laughs> it was nice of him to get a full count, too, to tell the complete story. The Sandy Koufax do four no-nos in his career again. This was the 60th anniversary of his third. Koufax, for those of you, and I love me some baseball history, Sandy Koufax, uh, retired the year after that. He had arthritis, a pitch for one more season, had that perfect game, and then retired after uh, the season where he ended that perfect game. Ended up in the Hall of Fame, youngest to be voted in the Hall of Fame at the age of 36. So I think if anyone's going to tell a story about Sandy Koufax on the day he third, threw his third of four no-hitters, it might as well be the legendary Vin Scully. And any day you can remember the magic of Vin Scully is a good day in my book. And I think we can just leave it at that, I suppose.